Welcome back to our examination of Texas history. In this lecture, we're going to look at French and Spanish exploration of the area that is now Texas. And during the period 1519, from the earliest Spanish mapping of the Texas coast until 1689. And in the following lecture, we'll look at in great detail at the Spanish administration of its colony of Texas. Now it's important to remember that after Christopher Columbus arrived in the Western Hemisphere in the, in the Caribbean in 1492, the Spanish quickly established colonies. The first colonies were in the Caribbean and they included Cuba, Hispaniola, which is now consists of two countries, Haiti and Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and initially Jamaica was under Spanish control and later um, changed hands to the British. But of even greater importance for the Spanish was Mexico. In 1519, uh, you probably recall the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés arrived on the east coast of Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, and very quickly took over the Aztec Empire, finding great, great wealth of gold and silver. And a few years later, the Spanish explorers led by Pizarro moved into South America conquered the Incan Empire, and found great wealth of uh, gold and silver in South America. Now this is important because the Spanish discovery of tremendous amounts of gold and silver in central Mexico and Peru quickly made it the wealthiest country in the, the world. It had the means to also establish the largest Navy in the world and dominated um, Europe at that time. So the Spanish, in addition to looking for gold and silver, many, many Spaniards, particularly the clergy, in other words, the priests and the monks, had a real evangelical zeal to spread Catholicism throughout the world. And many Spanish soldiers also did. So this led to a rather unique partnership between the Catholic Church and the Spanish state to expand the Spanish Empire as much as possible. The state was interested in finding gold and the church was interested in converting the natives to Catholicism. Now let's look briefly at the first Spanish explorers in what is now Texas. <clears throat> the Spanish explored the Gulf Coast in the early 1500s. Alvarez de Pineda sailed along the coast and mapped it, but we don't believe that he's ever landed. He certainly didn't establish any sort of permanent settlement. Shortly thereafter, an expedition, a large expedition, led by Narvaez, was on its way to what is now Texas, but it, in a storm and poor navigation, it struck the Florida coast. Well, the survivors of that expedition either walked or sailed along the coast in makeshift boats towards Texas. And when you read the deed, you can read more of the details in the textbook. They suffered from hurricanes, which you all know we, we experience in the Gulf of Mexico. Many people deserted and actually went off to live with uh, friendly Indian tribes. And they did not receive provisions from Spain. They didn't have enough. They had expected to receive uh, provisions from subsequent uh, expeditions. And so it was really, really a very difficult experience. Well, finally, around 1528, some survivors arrived 
near the current city of Galveston. Now of particular interest are two members of the Narvez expedition, Cabeza de Vaca, which means head of a cow in English. And while we might laugh at that, actually that was considered a very, very prestigious noble last name in Spain, and it had been for many centuries. Well, Cabeza de Vaca and a slave from Morocco in North Africa named Estavanquio, who was actually a slave of another Spaniard, but they, they were among the few who survived. And they traveled down the coast and various Indian bands or tribes took them as prisoners, they escaped, or then they worked as traders. And when they reached Texas, they lived among two tribes that we've already looked at in the previous lecture, the Karankawa and the Kwawitlakans. Then finally, after many years of a very difficult life, they escaped into northern Mexico and finally reaching Mexico City and talking with the Spanish authorities, they told them that they had heard the Indians talk about cities of gold. Now here in this map, uh, you can see I've circled the routes of three explorers. The one at the bottom of the map is Cabeza de Vaca. You can see how he traveled from near Gal uh, Galveston, traveled overland, went through what's now northern Mexico, and he went all the way across uh, the continent and actually ended up in on the Pacific Ocean in the Mexican uh, town of Culiacan. So he had quite a voyage. We'll talk about the other two explorers on this map in a minute. Um, this is a statue of Cabeza de Vaca it, here in Houston in Herman Park. Well, the Spanish heard of the cities of gold and obviously the Spanish eyes got big and they, they, so they quickly sent military expeditions to Texas to find the Indians who had spoken with the Vaca and try and find the gold. One of the largest expeditions was led by Coronado and 1,300 men traveled all the way to Texas, which was a long way in those days to travel overland. And they went further north on the plains. They even went uh, up into what's now Kansas. They didn't find any gold, but what it did is it extended Spanish authority in those areas because Coronado declared that all the lands that he traveled through uh, were subject to the jurisdiction of Spain. Now, Coronado found no gold or silver, but he did find the plains, and these, this is the area in the Texas Panhandle, just teeming with buffalo. He said that at all times of day and night, you could see huge herds of buffalo. And when he got back, he reported that this would be very good land for grazing Spanish cattle. Well, another expedition from Spain was led by Hernando de Soto. And in 1541, just a few years later, he led a large expedition to establish Spanish colonies in Florida. And that also led to the further exploration of the coast and the Mississippi River. However, like Narvez's expedition, this one met with a series of disasters and one of the survivors named Moscoso took the other survivors of the De Soto expedition into East Texas. And, but rather than return southern, in a southerly route to reach the Spaniards in Northern Mexico, he decided to go back to the Mississippi River area. Well, the net result of the, particularly these three explorers, De Vaca, Coronado, Moscoso, was to establish Spain's territorial claim 
to what we now call Texas. It also greatly increased the Spaniards' geographical knowledge of the region because they took cartographers with them to make detailed maps of the rivers and the coasts and the areas. And this is now beginning, they began also commercial contact with the Texas Indians and political contact. <clears throat> now let's move to what's now Northern Mexico and the current state of New Mexico. Well, after Cortez found extensive amount of gold and silver at the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, which is right next to present day, what is present day Mexico City, um, the Aztecs explained how they had gotten the gold and particularly the silver from areas north of Mexico City. So the Spaniards went there and they set up very, very large, very large um, and successful, primarily silver mines in the areas in the state, with present state of Guanajuato, for those of you who are in New Mexico, and even a little further north uh, in the state of Zacatecas. And this gold and silver was uh, you know, shipped back to Spain. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, made Spain the wealthiest country in Europe. Well, the question was, what happens if they kept going north? Um, and as we heard a few minutes ago, when uh, people like Coronado came back and said they'd heard rumors of cities of gold, that piqued their interest. Well, as the Spaniards were settling the area around Zacatecas, north of Mexico City, they had constant war warfare with some of the northern Mexican Indians. And so the Spanish set up a system of what's called the Presidio and the Missions. And I'll explain that. Presidio were fortified bases for the Spanish soldiers. Only the soldiers live there. And they use those as bases um, to protect, protect Spanish interests in the region. Now the missions, as the name suggests, consisted of churches, Catholic churches, with Franciscan priests. The Franciscans are an order of Catholic priests. The Catholic religion has a number of orders of priests. You have the Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, etc. And the Franciscans uh, were were founded by the Catholic Saint uh, Saint Francis of Assisi. Okay, so the Franciscan priests and monks, and a monk is a member of the clergy who is not ordained as a priest. They went out, and their mission and their goal was to Christianize the Indians, to bring Christianity with them, to save their souls, and also. They wanted to make them loyal Spanish subjects, so they teach them Spanish. They and they, so they had a dual purpose here. They, in these missions they also taught the Indians practical skills. We, we will see, for instance, later in the course, the famous Spanish mission of the Alamo in San Antonio, which was just this: they had a church, they had workshops where they could teach the Indians uh, basic carpentry uh, practical skills. And the missions were normally located near the presidios or the military bases uh, in case they needed to have protection. I might mention, it's very interesting, when Christopher Columbus first arrived and encountered the Native Americans, whom he of course called Indians, thinking he was in India, he wasn't really sure if these human beings had souls because they had never found people like this. So he didn't immediately ask for the Spanish king and queen to send missionaries. He first sent 50 of the Indians he found in the Caribbean back to Spain. And in Spain, these Indians were taught the Spanish language, and which took a few years, and they were taught 
the very basic elements of the Bible and the Catholic religion. And then they had to go and appear between, before the Spanish bishop in, in Madrid, who asked them questions about the Catholic religion. The bishop was very, very pleased with how well they answered and said, yes, these, these people have souls, they can be Christianized. And after the Catholic bishop said that, uh, Spain sent many, many missionaries to the Western Hemisphere, and we'll see more about them later. <clears throat> so again, in the missions, the Franciscan priests sought to Catholicize and Hispanicize. That means make Spanish the Indians in Northern Mexico, New Mexico, and then Texas as these missions expanded. But there really wasn't much effort towards this before the year 1600, and it really, really only increased significantly in the state of Texas after the year 1700, as we'll see. Okay, now in the 1580s, Spanish colonies began to emerge on the northern side of the Rio Grande River in what is now the state of New Mexico. <clears throat> the Spanish governor there, by the name of Oñate, founded the city of Santa Fe in 1610, and he extended Spanish control into the entire area of what is now New Mexico. And the missionaries there were particularly act active. They moved from New Mexico to the Humanos in West Texas, and you'll recall from our discussion of the Texas Indians, that the Humanos regularly traded and traveled with the Cados in East Texas, as well as the Pueblo communities in New Mexico. So having the missionaries convert the Humanos turned out to be very effective in spreading Christianity to the Cados. And in fact, the, the Cados later asked the Spanish to send more missionaries uh, to them in East Texas. Now, one very interesting policy of uh, Oñato in New Mexico was he deliberately released horses and cattle into the wild, and he wanted to see if they could survive in the northern areas, if there was enough natural rainfall and if the grass was sufficient for them to uh, reproduce. And you will recall from your earlier studies that both horses and cattle were not native to the Western Hemisphere, but rather had been introduced to the uh, hemisphere by the Spaniards. And this was the very beginning of the very large wild herds that ended up stocking the ranches of both the Spaniards and later the Anglo-Texans. We'll see later how in the south of Texas, there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of wild cattle. And the cowboy's job was to go out, rope them, and put the brand on of, of a ranch. And then they would take them and have the famous cattle drives up to the railroads in places like Kansas. We'll look at that in detail later. Now, if you ever travel to New Mexico, you can see here uh, on, on a, the original s signature of uh, Oñate. <clears throat> and this is the statue of Oñate on a horse. Um, and one thing I'd like to mention is there's a, a widespread myth that when a, a political or military leader is on a statue of a horse, that the position of the front feet indicates whether the person died in battle or um, was just wounded. And the myth goes that if the horse has both of the front feet on the ground, well, the person did not die in battle, died of natural causes. If the horse, as depicted here, has one foot in the air, it means that the person on the horse was wounded in battle and two feet in the air 
it means that the person on the horse died in battle. Uh, there are some instances when that is true, but in general, the people who make these statues um, did not take that into consideration. <clears throat> now, looking at West Texas, the Spaniards, until the late 1600s, really, really um, focused their efforts on the northern part of Mexico and uh, New Mexico and not the state of Texas. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Spanish introduced horses and the many, many horses that were released by Oñate and went out in the wild to reproduce, there were large herds. These horses really revolutionized the lives of the, of the Indians in Texas. Also, some of the Indians would steal the horses from the Spaniards, but it became long before white people arrived in Texas from the east, the Indians had been using horses for uh, quite a time. Now, the Apaches, for instance, became very, very skilled at hunting and warfare, and that allowed them to help dominate other tribes. And also, the horses obviously increased the speed uh, and distance of trade, and so it had a positive impact on commercial activity. <clears throat> this is a drawing from how the Indians would use the horses to hunt buffalo. This drawing was made a little later than the period we're talking about, but the principle applies. How did the Indians kill the buffalo before they had horses? Well, on the plains and the area where the buffalo are, it's not 100% flat. They're often small cliffs. So what the Indians would do before they got horses is they get behind a huge herd of buffalo, and there were buffalo everywhere, and they'd light the grass on fire um, you know, when, when it was dry, and when there was a wind blowing towards the cliff. And so the smoke from the fire and the fire itself would frighten the buffalo, and they would run and run, and they would, as shown here in this drawing, they would fall off the cliff. Well, falling off the cliff either killed them or usually just broke their legs, but they couldn't move. So what happened is at the bottom of the cliff, uh, the Indians, including Indian women, would uh, cut the buffalo's throat to kill them. And at that point, they would take the meat and the skin for hides, etc. Now, this whole process was made much easier once the Indians got horses. <clears throat> they could quickly, quickly ride around a herd and they could encourage the buffalo to fall off of the cliff. Also, being on horses, the Indians could quickly escape if you know, some buffalo started to, to attack them. <clears throat> now, in the 1680s in, in New Mexico, the Pueblo people revolted against the Spanish and killed 400 Spaniards. And this was because the Spaniards um, were trying to Catholicize them, but in the temp, in the, as part of that process, they were prohibiting the Indians from their traditional religious practices. Well, after this happened, the Spanish sent more and more military uh, forces to New Mexico, as well as a greater number of missionaries. <clears throat> now, this is a, a photo of a reconstruction of the first Spanish mission in what's now the state of um, El Paso. It's near, excuse me, the state of Texas. It's near El Paso. And this was a Franciscan Catholic uh, priest mission to the Tiagua, Tiagua Indians in that area. And this is the oldest mission in Texas. This photo is of a reconstruction from the 1800s, so it's not an original uh, building. <clears throat> On this map, I've circled in the center there uh, the location of the mission we just saw. And you can see above that to the north is Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, 
As we've seen, Texas was really on the very edge of the Spanish Empire. The Spanish had not found any gold or silver in either New Mexico or Texas. So there was very, very little Spanish colonization in uh, Texas. Well, that all changed when the French became interested in establishing colonies in Texas because at this period of time, France and Spain were, um, were enemies in Europe, traditional enemies. So in the 1670s and 1680s, the French explorer de Salle had spent about 15 years exploring the area in the Great Lakes in the United States and then down the Mississippi River. And you recall from your studies of U.S. history at this period that the French controlled Eastern Canada and they moved down into the Great, <coughs> excuse me, the Great Lakes region and controlled all that land there. The French did not really set up farms. They didn't, as the English did on the East Coast, but rather the French engaged largely in trading with the Indians and they they wanted the from the Indians the fur of animals, particularly beavers, because the beaver skin was used to make hats, and that was the fad in Europe among wealthy French women was to wear beaver skin hats. And so the French could become very wealthy by buying beaver skins from the Indians. So the French in general had a very friendly relationship with the Indians, and in exchange they would give the Indians metal products such as axes or um, you know, metal pots and things like that. <clears throat> well, the Sol, in addition to the Great Lakes and the upper northern reaches of the Mississippi River, he was the first Frenchman to come all the way down the Mississippi River to the area near Orle New Orleans, the mouth of the Mississippi River, and he claimed that entire area for France. And the reason he was particularly wanted to do that was Spain controlled Florida, Spain controlled Mexico, and what's now Texas, and the French were very worried that if the Spanish moved further between Florida and Texas, the Spanish would can take control of the Mississippi River in what's now Louisiana, and that would prevent the French from sending products down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and back to France. <clears throat> well, for the Spaniards, this was a wake-up call, that here we have a Frenchman working for the French government coming down and claiming this huge area around the Mississippi River for France. So, and in 1864, excuse me, 1684, La Salle again returned to the Gulf Coast and he wanted to find the mouth of the Mississippi River again and, and, a, and he had a large expedition to start a colony. Well, because of the very poor navigation, uh, La Salle's expedition landed 400 miles west of, of, of New Orleans in the area down near Matagora Bay in South Texas. Well, they, they tried to set up a colony there. It was a total disaster. There were hostile Indians in the area. Some of the Spaniards mutinied. They wanted to go home. They didn't want to stay. There was actual starvation and actually some of the Spaniards resulted in cannibalism, cannibalism by eating each other in order not to starve. Be that as may, La Salle did explore the area of Matagora Bay in uh, sort of southern Texas, and he formally established a French outpost in the name of France. And then from the small outpost, explorers went 
as far west as we think the Rio Grande River and even the Pecos River out in West Texas. Um, this map will help you visualize it. You can see Matagora Bay there. <coughs> um, I've circled it in red. And they had expeditions that went down to the Rio Grande River. But then uh, LaSalle's vessel was, main vessel was uh, destroyed in, in a storm with the result that um, he tried to to walk home, walk, not home, to France, but walk towards the Mississippi River. And you can see, I've circled in red, where they think that LaSalle passed away. So the colony in the coast, LaSalle and a group of men left the colony in the coast, a very small colony. And LaSalle took most of the men and the priests and the women and children stayed there. And they were told not to let the Indians in because they were worried about the Karankarawa Indians with whom they had a hostile relationship. Well, net result was within two years that colony was uh, destroyed by the Karankawa Indians. And LaSalle had not been able, as I mentioned, to walk to, to sail back to France or for other French colonies because his main ship, La Belle, sank in a storm. And so uh, LaSalle was forced to try and to walk through East Texas to reach the Mississippi and he likely died in East Texas. <clears throat> so the French did not establish a permanent colony in what's Texas, but the Spaniards heard about this, and they were furious that the French had moved into what they considered part of their colonial empire. So Spain immediately dispatched five sea and six land expeditions to try and find the French. They didn't know what had happened to them. Well, they initially found, heard of a few, what could be Europeans living with Indians. They went and they found one who, who was French. He'd been a member of LaSalle's expedition and he had voluntarily gone off to live with the Indians. That was why he was still alive. And finally, the Spanish found in Matagora Bay, the ruins of the fort, and they found a few uh, few bodies, um, and that they were happy to see that the Spaniards were because that meant that the French had failed. And a very interesting, LaSalle's ship La Belle, which means the beautiful one. In the eighteen eighties, uh, some archaeologists found it offshore. It had sunk and they wanted to excavate it. So what they did is, you can see in this photograph, they it, they built a dam all around it, a big circular dam of big pieces of metal. And then they took huge pumps and it took several weeks and they pumped out all the area. So the area where these workers are is surrounded by water on all sides of about 20 feet of water. So um, this expedition, they carefully, carefully um, removed the mud and whatnot, and they found the ship in amazingly good shape. <clears throat> this is what they found. They, this was removed uh, very carefully from the ocean floor with cranes, and it's now in Austin, in the Bullock, Texas State History Museum, which if you've been to Austin, it's right on the edge of the campus of the University of Texas. And you can see in the left, upper left part of the photograph, all the people looking at the exhibits of all the many, many articles they found in the ship. Uh, it's quite worth seeing next time you're in Austin. <clears throat> Now what we have is the Spaniards really, really now, after their fear of the French coming in, started establishing more missions, more colonial towns, and presidios, or military forts, in East Texas, 
the idea being East Texas is more habitable, habitable rather, than it has forests. And the Caddo Indians there were very friendly. And by controlling East Texas, the Spanish hoped to prevent the French from ever moving in again. Now this is a replica of a Franciscan mission that was established in the forests among the Caddo in the 1690s. And it's Mission San Francisco de los Tejas. And Tejas, you recall, was a Caddo word meaning friend. Well, the Spaniards, instead of calling them Caddos, often just call them Tejas. And our final slide here. <clears throat> By 1689, Texas remained on the very edge or periphery of the Spanish Empire. There was very little Spanish interest in the huge area of Texas because there was no gold or silver there. And Spain only moved in um, after La Salle tried to found a colony because Spain wanted main interest at this point was to keep France out. The Spanish missionaries, however, very much wanted to convert the Caddos in East Texas and convinced the Spanish government to send some soldiers and help them um, establish the missions among many missions among the Caddos in East Texas. Unfortunately, these buildings have deteriorated because they were made of wood and East Texas being a, a large forest is um, is very humid and so wood rots away after um, several centuries. Okay, thank you very much.